more importantly than Jedzy, though, we've got Corrie on on the line with us. She's the the real backbone behind this this project. Jedzy just fronts it up on the social media stuff. I know how this stuff works. Don't worry, uh, I've worked him out, Corrie. Uh, welcome, welcome to like the politics? show. <laughs> so, do you want to just introduce yourself briefly, guys? Go on, Corrie. Oh no, go on, Arif. I insist. Everyone knows me already anyway, so it's all good. Go on then. I'm, uh, I'm Ari from Help the Homeless Leicester. Um, and we do what it says on the Help the Homeless in Leicester. And go on, Corey. I'm Corey, and I'm the project manager for Help the Homeless Leicester, a.k.a. the brains behind the scenes. Absolutely. And I've got I've got you, you on today, and hopefully we'll be joined by Hussein from um, Leicester Community services later on um he's going to dial in at, at some point just we're following on really from last week's show where we were highlighting good practice out in the community about the community organizations that have come together and responding to the COVID-19 situation and I know your work goes well beyond that you know you you were formed as an organization to deal with a range of different issues outside of COVID-19 but how's COVID-19 been for you for your project? I'll let Corrie answer that. Um, it's been difficult. The demand has increased in many dimensions, but one thing that we've always been good at is adapting to the current need. So we did that and we realised quite quickly that we needed to sort of broaden our reach and our footprint almost and, and to the vulnerabilities that, that we were helping and, and not just homelessness. Um, so we got a good team of volunteers together and we sort of thrashed it out and worked out what we could do and how we could feasibly meet the needs that we were kind of seeing um so and it's just quite quickly grown from there like everything we do it snowballs into something pretty amazing to be honest mm. so yeah i, I yeah, know you've 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 you, you're doing food banks you're doing deliveries you're yep. doing some social isolation stuff. You've yep. created a database. Yes. Yeah. How, how was the database stuff? Because that, that's interesting. You know, there's other groups that, that are doing those things as well and serving different audiences. But the database is quite interesting. That, <laughs> so the that's database. Come, that's, oh. that's come, I'll, 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 it's come from Raji, isn't it? So basically what's happened there is um, at the start when we needed to deliver the food parcels and whatnot, I put a, a plea out on Facebook for anybody who wants to help delivering these food parcels. Um, and a chap called Rajiv came forward and said, look, I'd love to help. Um, we had plenty of volunteers at the time. And then he soon said, though, why don't you let me um, help with the organizing side of things, the database side of things, the whole vetting procedures, etc." cetera. Um, that's my speciality. I've got a call center. So I said, well, perfect. So then that's when he set up the phone line. Um, and we've kind of just gone from there where he's been manning the phone lines, you know, take, taking all the information, kind of vetting the, the people that have been coming through, so to say, to make sure people mm -hmm. aren't taking advantage. Um, and um, it, it's just been a natural progression from that, to be honest with you. So the database, it um, works really well. The, once all the local authority, the local you know, offices, et cetera, start to find out other social services, that kind of thing. I think 70% of our referrals now come from places like social care, DWP, et cetera, et cetera. So it help, helps us to weed out the people that want to take advantage. So I think it's been really important that, you know, we had that set up. Yeah, that was one of one of the points that the other groups mentioned, although there there's probably a 95% need of the people that you do serve there's always going to be those that are trying to take advantage of any system and, and skim off the top. Has that, has that been the same for you guys? But how, I think the thing is as well, you've got to work together as to as a team to, to define those people that are in genuine need, you know, um, just touching on, I guess, some of the homelessness, you know, lots of these people have complex issues and may have substance use issues. Uh, and therefore, some people might not necessarily believe that these people are, are worthy or genuinely in need. So that's something that we've had to work through as a team to work out sort of the people that that we are going to help and how we're going to help them, how frequently we're going to help them, what the process is, what's expected of them and, and you know, vice versa, what's expected of us. So, and it's not something that's easy and it's not something that you get right overnight. You know, it takes time. It takes, it takes making sort of 
errors or you know identifying things as as the need grows and changes and working with those professionals as you're well aware we we work hard to build working relationships with other professionals in in our area and others so by having the professionals being the the main ones that are doing the referrals it helps with the element of due diligence really yeah absolutely it's worked out quite well from your audience that you're serving through COVID-19, what, what would be the percentage for the particular, the Muslim community, would you say? Quite high, actually. Mm, that's and, quite high. And, and in Leicester East, predominantly in terms of, you know, these areas, Highfield, St. Matthews, well, Devington, I'll, I'll North you, Evington. I'll, t- I'll tell you what we found. Where there's already an existing food bank in place, an efficient food bank in place, for example, Beaumont Lees has got a couple um, that we uh, we know Christ the King and I think it's E2 up there. You've got um, Netherall, which has got a uh, peace centre. You've got Saffron Lane, which has got Gold Hill. And then you've got Leicestershire South uh, Food Bank, which kind of covers Wigston, etc. Them areas, we've got the least amount of referrals. I mean, in some, we've not even got one. But then the other areas where there is a food bank probably still running, LE2, Highfields, LE5, Evington, Stroke, um, edging towards Netherhall. Uh, then you've got LE3, mm. Aikman Avenue, and LE3 more towards the uh, Narborough Road side and Leicester Forest East. And um, what's the area called there? I forget. Which one? Behind Jaguar. Behind Jaguar. Oh, Bronson. 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 Bronson, Bronson yeah. So all, no, Bronson. So all that area there, we've got most deliveries there and LE2, LE5. Oh, that's mm. interesting. So that's something to take forward as a as a learning opportunity then the established food banks you know we why in 2020 we need established food banks it's a scandal in itself to be honest but you know it is what it is we are where we are and some of the 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 national policy around that we're never going to you know solve on this program or or a lot of others but i think from that what you're saying is the more established the networks are locally on the ground the better and the quicker to mobilize things become is that is that, is that right definitely, yeah, 100%. definitely without a doubt 100 percent. when you've got the networks there in place and you've got the support of the wider community uh, other organizations uh you know other like for example um like the local authority and that kind of stuff then it, make, it makes it, it makes it a lot easier for you to try and implement <laughs> changes and do stuff basically and trust and knowledge as well so like E2 for example because of their funding scenario at the moment they're only um, taking referrals for that for their local area but of course they've still been getting calls for requests for food parcels and support and so instead of just being a you know a blanket no we can't help because you fall outside of of the postcode um you know there's this charity or this organization or this service that actually I can point you in the direction of I can signpost you to so we've had a few people call in and have food parcels through our service because they weren't eligible through the service of E2 Um, and you know that's kind of been the way forward so CSG the community support grant they've picked up a lot now of the food support and food provision for those in B&Bs and emergency accommodation placed by the local authority but it's taken them a little while to to get that haste so in the meantime we've stepped in so um you know it's it's worked out quite well that we just work together as as a wider broader team to work out who's delivering what where and who yeah we were talking about that last last week the local authority the wheels of the local authority take a bit longer to turn um but when they start to turn they can they can mobilize very quickly but it's just getting that initial traction going and then the groups that are on the ground the networks they can move straight away within a couple of hours they can build themselves they have that local reach they have that community support they know the networks they know their uh, areas so it, it's, it's easier to mobilize very quickly when you're on the ground mm. i've not just got both of you on today to talk about your projects although you know it's very important the work you're doing there's some general stuff that I wanted to pick your brain on because I know you you've already mentioned you're quite quick at mobilizing you're quite quick at adapting you build your services from the bottom up going forward so one of the the points that I wanted to to raise with you today is coming out of COVID-19 in terms of how the world's going to look going forward what do you think your biggest challenges are going to be? I think homelessness prevention is going to be bigger than it ever was before. Really? I think 
Yeah, uh, central government have put a lot of protection in place in terms of eviction processes have obviously been halted and been postponed. But that doesn't mean that they're not going to continue. And, you know, there are going to be many people that have built up rent arrears and have got and, and have previously struggled financially. So in no way you're going to have the spare funds to to make an affordable plan to, to sort of erase those areas that have been built during COVID-19 and I think that's just one aspect of it really I think I think it's going to be difficult you know and then there's the mental health and all that from from not only the financial constraints and the stresses but also the isolation the the lack of literally physical touch you know there are people that live on their own and have been abiding by the guidelines and haven't even had so much as a touch on the hand for for seven eight weeks now so I think it's it's going to be massively different. And you, Jetsy? Yeah, pretty much what Corey said. I mean, we've already started talking about ways we might be able to adapt the services we offer, uh, what we might be able to bring in. Uh, the befriending service thing about where it tackles people that are just lonely, that's something mm. that some of our volunteers have already started doing with some of our um, regular or ex service users that we've advocated accommodation for. Um, and it's something that's needed because just that mm. chat on the phone makes a massive difference. Oh, I've not spoke to someone for like, I've not spoke to anyone for like three, four days, or I've not seen anybody for three, four days. Like I said, eventually, you know, obviously everyone's mental health, uh, the state of the mental health is different. Some people can handle that. I mean, I'm a person who will happily just sit there and not see anybody for a few days and I'm fine. But some people actually need interaction. And when you actually get people ringing up, they feel like, um, you know, someone, someone cares about them. There's mm. someone actually looking out for them, that kind of stuff. Uh, and as well as that, um, I think, it, like I said, we're going to have to adapt uh, our services in a way where our volunteers are probably going to be more involved, um, possibly making visits if that's possible. But also, um, like I said, the homelessness prevention side of things, that's probably going to take up a lot of our time afterwards as well. Uh, because not just people on the streets that we help, you know, we'll also prevent people from losing their tenancies if we can step in and get funding for them just to cover their arrears and on a plan with the landlord, we do that kind of stuff as well. So it's going to be a lot of tweaking, I think, and adjusting, definitely. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, 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 I think you're right. If there was, um, if you were the local authority now, or we, we, I know there's a whole range of different responsibilities they'll have going forward, um, but for community-facing things if there were three things you would say focus on what what would they be the three things you'd focus on if you were a local authority putting services back into the front line well mental health is definitely going to be predominant i think yeah that needs to be well, just on the mental is, health one one of, one of my colleagues yeah. she she was um delivering uh, a food parcel to one of her constituents the other day and unfortunately her son passed away about three four days before and mm. she was actually the first person that she'd spoke to since her son had passed away and mm. she ended up standing on the doorstep mm. with her for 45 minutes just so she could offload and have that conversation with her and etc cetera, etc cetera. and it was so important to her and she sent her a, a message later on in, in the evening just thanking her for taking the time to listen to her and she said she had nobody else to turn to to have that conversation with and although it's not, you know, taken away her grief of losing her son and et cetera, et cetera, it was a massive help. Um, mm. And the mental health and that isolation, I think is going to be huge going forward. We're quite lucky in some communities of the way that we network around our families and so on and so on. But it's not like that for everybody. Definitely no, not. it's not. Definitely not. And I think we're taking for granted, don't we? And I, and I hope that's one of the things that does stick from this crisis. And you know that we learn to to appreciate a little more those those little things. You know, the communication, the touch, the the friendships. You know, the yeah, totally. Spirit. Well, you mentioned Gold Hill earlier when we were speaking to Gold Hill last week. Uh, I said to um, Josh, "Would you ever think that a mosque?" would be providing food parcels for Gold Hill Adventure Playground in the middle of Saffron Lane. You know, and if you told anybody that 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years, and some with their, you know, their ignorance, current ignorance would still say it couldn't happen. But it's happening. It's happening all over the city. You guys are helping a number of people and, and projects are working with projects, aren't you? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But that's, that's, always been, that's always been my ethos from day one since I started this. 
We've never felt let anybody feel alienated, discriminated against. We make everyone feel welcome. You know what, Kirk? I've even had it on the streets, which is when I've been helping someone on the streets, very early days. One guy goes to me, why are you helping me? I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, you're Muslim. Why are you helping me for? So that, that's the kind of level of ignorance we've had to nice. kind of tackle. But I've always made a concerted effort. And Corey will tell you, I mean, she knows me really well. She's like my sister now, yeah? I make sure everybody is involved in whatever way, shape or form we can do it, whether that's organisations, volunteers. You know, we've got religious volunteers from like different faith groups, people of no religion. Corey doesn't believe in anything. Uh, you know, we've got straight volunteers, gay volunteers, black volunteers, you know, white volunteers. We make everybody feel welcome. And only that way, working together with people and letting them see your, you know, your actions as a human rather than what you labeled as because of your beard or color or whatever it is, religion, will people see the true humanity? What, you know, what, what, what the world is really like and what it should be like rather than putting stereotypes and things and that kind of stuff. Yeah, to- totally agree. So mental health, that was one. I'm not letting you off these three. Number two. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, number two I think would be grasping the opportunity to continue to engage those that were least engaged i.e those that were entrenched in street lifestyle so that have now started to sort of make small steps to, to change their life and to engage with the support networks that have been trying for so long and now are so to not not let go of the opportunity that has been forced upon us yeah, definitely. Make of that what you will. <laughs> yeah, well, Jesse, I mean, like, you cannot just yeah. agree with everything that Corey says. <laughs> no, but, I know she's team. the brains he behind this. One. You've he got to have an opinion. Best. You've got to have an opinion on this. You don't have to agree with her. I know she's influential and she's powerful, but have an opinion. <laughs> Someone I, hope would say Ofcom, scary. I hope Ofcom is watching this because this is <laughs> bullying online. Anyway, that was the same thing. Yeah, so th- there's that as well, which I agree with again. But I think also, whilst we've got these people engaging, the ones that are entrenched in the street lifestyle that maybe are, you know, they don't generally engage, I think try and get some kind of recovery service, some recovery, you know, workers to kind of get them to maybe the ones that have got the active addictions that they've probably been involved with for quite a long time try and get them to maybe interact and get them off that but they say about the cuts coming from you know the government and obviously there needs to be more funding around that but I think in order to prevent homelessness or get people off the streets that is a big factor that needs more concentration on I think to mm. because we we get people reaching out to us saying you know what I've had enough of this I've been using x or this or that or whatever for so long but I really love to stop but I can't but if there was support network was there, you know, one person working with three, four people intensely, giving them quality, uh, quality, what do you call it, counselling, that kind of stuff, then it'd make a difference. But when you've got one person working with 15 different people or 20 people, how can they give quality to one person or then three, four people that they should be working with rather than trying to split it between 20 people? It doesn't work. So if you're going to want to prevent prevent it, prevent the uh, people, you know, stop people um, if you want to get them involved in recovery that kind of stuff then you're yeah. going to have to give some kind of quality there I think yeah urgency is definitely an issue I think the thing is you've got to sort of grab the ball by the horns and when someone tells you they're ready they're ready then and there they're not ready for in three weeks, weeks time later. to start their to start their script or have their first appointment they're ready now and you know that's again that's one of our values as an organization is urgency and that's know, really that's, it's, it's really that's funny it. you say that we went to um well I, I went with a group to scotland you must have heard of the public health model um and the scotland's violent reduction network that they set up it became mm-hmm. famous for reducing scotland having the highest death rate in the world at one point yes. even more than new york believe it or not um and we went up there and they showed us a range of different programs and interventions and how they work with all of these different groups but the one thing that i really really stuck with me and i took away from there was when we were speaking to one of the guys who's you know ex-drug addict you know he's been in prison for attempted murder uh he'd done a range of different things but now he was in charge of a he was the the manager of a catering business that was working in a um what was the thing it was a a, a dental surgery but a big one it was a training dental surgery so all people that were training to be dentists they were doing all the catering there's about 700 people in this um this uh, big training hub and he was the manager of the catering side of that but the one thing he said that stuck with me is my magic moment i was offered support 
probably a thousand times before that one time where it actually felt relevant to me. And what you just said was, it's not when we can put services in place on our schedules, on our timetables, it's making them available when it's right for that person that needs them. And, and it you was know, hard to hear. It was, it was really, really yeah. hitting, hard hitting. And one of the things for us is, and I think it's something that for some of the volunteers and, and some of my colleagues, I think for me, it was very important for people to understand that just because somebody refuses their offer of, of support or help or the way out the first, second, third, fourth, fifth time doesn't mean that you shouldn't offer the sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth or tenth. Absolutely. Yeah, totally, totally agree with that. How, how difficult are these some of these issues in our community, Jedzy? Uh, the, the coming, there's a lot more coming mm. coming forward. Um, when I first started this, I don't think I saw any Asian people on the streets, apart from one or two, that were kind of like regular, so to say. Um, and as time's gone on, that's changed. This That's changed. You've got um, not just the Im immigrants or people that have come over here, but you've also got people that were born here that unfortunately have taken made, made wrong decisions when it comes to um, a, a substance abuse, that kind of stuff, that our families had enough and they've kicked them out. And that's quite, well, it's not rare, but it, ha it doesn't really happen that much in the Asian stroke, um, in, in, in the Indian and well, maybe South Indian, South Asian communities, where because we, we kind of like grasp our own family and like stop them from slipping through the net. But I think sometimes enough's enough and the parents have had enough and literally are just letting the kids go. And we're seeing a lot more, uh, um, a lot more of that on the, uh, of those kind of people on the streets where we never used to see them at all before. Yeah, it's, it's mm. true. Even even in my own ward, my my political ward, which is Stonygate, which Evington Road is part of, I've seen an increase of people that are, are begging up and down and on Evington Road. And when you you try and engage with them, you know they're they're sometimes quite dismissive. They're sometimes quite can be aggressive as well, to be honest. And sometimes they 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 will have a conversation with you, but the majority, well, the ones I've come across on Evington Road, anyway, they do have accommodation. And there's a big difference between those that are genuinely rough sleeping and homeless and those that are choosing that lifestyle because they're supporting substance is misuse issues or how alcohol addiction and whatever. How, how do you uh, deal with that? There's no, there's no fixed science to it. There's, there's no, there's no method. It's, it's just, I think you know what it is with begging, let's call it begging because that's what it is. It's a massive problem all around the country. Um, it's very lucrative. And this is from the people that we work with on the street. You could be a beggar with no kind of begging skills at all, with a cup sat in the middle of Leicester somewhere, and you'll still get £10 a day eventually. So someone who knows how to beg, they've got the right skills, you know, they bully their way into the right spots in the middle of town centre. 30, 40, 50 quid is easy doable, and that's tax-free. And then for them to use on whatever they want to use it on. And that, and that is from the people that we work with on the street. So begging is a massive issue. Um, how do we tackle it? You know what? We get to know people because obviously we work with the uh, you know Rush Sleepers Initiative, that kind of stuff. We get names banded across to us, so we've kind of it kind of helps us to weed out the people that we know are just there begging or the ones that have actually got tenancies. Uh, the public get duped all the time. We're constantly getting messages about this person, that person, or this person says he needs this for that. Can you help him? Why don't you go on and help him? This and that. It turns out that we actually know that person. They've got accommodation, so it's 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 a kind of worms once you get into it, literally. Yeah, we, we I come across that a huge amount of times. And I, I always tell people, and I do it myself as well, so I try and lead by example. I try never to give them money, but I'll always say, if you want me to buy you something, I'll go and buy you some food, I'll go and buy you a drink, I'll go into the co-op and get you whatever. And they don't want it. Most of the time they say, I don't want that. I just want the money. And I say, well, I can't help you then. But we're going to go to a break. We've got a, a, a few seconds left. We'll, we'll return on the other side. Um, so I'll just wait for our coordinator to come in and, and tell us what's what. So I've got some more questions for you on the other side. Rabbana ya Rabbana 
greatest, nothing can compare to you. Oh Allah, you are the greatest, nothing can compare to you. Oh Allah, you are the greatest, nothing can compare to you. Giving, loving, merciful Lord, all praise is due to you. Rabbana, ya Rabbana, Rabbana, ya Rabbana, Rabbana, ya Rabbana, Rabbana, ya Rabbana. Oh, my Lord, I raise my hand. Yahafuna, ya extra special. When I was told that we are going to open the masjid today, I didn't think we would have so many people today. Maybe 50, maybe 70, maximum 100. But today when we are coming with the van and I saw so many people in the shops, in the rooftops, in the houses, in the cafeteria, everybody around, what about you have made us so proud and made us so happy. People of Gudinesh, you should be extremely proud. Mashallah, you should be very happy that Mashallah you have such a beautiful masjid and such beautiful people as well, Alhamdulillah. But we also need to thank the people who are the suburb of this masjid. So their family made the intention that they want to build a masjid in remembrance of their mother. And lastly, I would like to thank you all. Alhamdulillah, you have made us so happy. Today, it's like we are all sitting between our own family. And it's, it's, it's like a day of Eid for us. So, so we thank you all from our family that you have given us this honor and you have come in this gathering. And also we thank everybody who has taken part in this construction in any way by donation or by supporting by any way who have helped and uh, in this construction may Allah Ta'ala accept the efforts and make it a uh, means of the forgiveness in this world and the hereafter. Greatest, nothing can compare to you. Oh Allah, you are the greatest, nothing can compare to you. Oh Allah, you are the greatest, nothing can compare to you. Giving, loving, merciful Lord, all praise is due to you. Rabbana, ya Rabbana, Rabbana, ya Rabbana. Nothing can compare to you. Oh Allah, you are the greatest. Nothing can compare to you. Oh Allah, you are the greatest. Nothing can compare to you. Giving, loving, merciful Lord, all praise is due to you. Rabbana, ya Rabbana, Rabbana, ya Rabbana. يخافون يوما تتقلب فيه القلوب والأبصار. Today has become extra special. When I was told that we are going to open the masjid today, 
I didn't think we would have so many people today. Maybe 50, maybe 70, maximum 100. But today when we are coming with the van and I saw so many people and the shops and the rooftops in the houses, in the cafeteria, everybody around. Bhagwan, you have made us so proud and made us so happy. People of Gujarat, you should be extremely proud. Mashallah, you should be very happy that Mashallah, you have such a beautiful masjid and such beautiful people as well. Alhamdulillah. But we also need to thank the people who are the suburb of this masjid. So their family made the intention that they want to build a masjid in remembrance of their mother. And lastly, I would like to thank you all. Alhamdulillah, you have made us so happy. Today it's like we are all sitting between our own family and it's, it's, it's like a day of Eid for us. So, so we thank you all from our family that you have given us this honor and you have come in this gathering. And also we thank everybody who has taken part in this construction in any way by donation or by supporting by any way who have helped and uh, in this construction may Allah ta'ala... Asalaamu As Alaikum. Welcome back to the second part of COVID-19 in the Community Show. This is Ramadan FM 87.7 with me, Kirk Master. I've got two guests from the first part of the show and I've been joined by Hassan and Hussein, who are just roaming around the building trying to find some reception, but they'll be joining us in a minute. Welcome, welcome, guys. Say, introduce yourself if you can hear me if you're all right now. Yeah, hi, this is Hassan Ali from Leicester Community Services and Hussein Ali from Gifting Humanity. Welcome and thank you for joining us. We're gonna we're gonna pick up the conversation where we left off before we went on to the break, um, and we were just talking about really the the types of issues that are affecting the Muslim community in particular. And I know you two guys have been doing how many miles have you two done in your car in the past eight months, eight weeks? Well, sorry. Well, to be honest, we've done uh, we've done uh, eleven thousand parcels. 11,500 11, parcels, uh, the small ones, uh, 2,000 Ramzan packs and 1,000 Eid packs we're going to be doing. It. So we've gone, we've done Leicester, Leicestershire, and we've done Cambridge, Derby, Nottingham, and quite a few places nationally. Wow. And that's all with no driving license, no MOT, and no road oh, tax. <laughs> no, no, I'm only joking. I'm only joking. Uh, just, just a green van. Just one green van. <laughs> and what's been your biggest challenge for us Kirk, the challenge is uh, basically because we've covered quite a few areas uh you know uh, knowing different areas like for example going in bronston going new parks uh going nice monster and places like that where we weren't going before and some of the places we've never seen so i think Getting to know the people there and they understanding, they said these lads are back, uh, they come to deliver. So it's been a good thing. It's been a uh, video. Okay. And how's what's the response been like? Response is amazing, Kirk. I mean, I, I can't uh, bless the community uh, much. Uh, it's amazing the way they've uh, responded back to us. And, you know, with kindness, I think it's amazing. You know, it's amazing. And uh, more than anything, Kirk, is uh, working with the community, different faiths. Uh, faiths, different caste, color, creed, and um, I mean, we've had people from Colville all the way from Colville where we were dis distributed. They wanted to come Leicester and they helped us mm. distribute in Leicester. So that relationship, what we built with uh, people out of Leicester, so it's been amazing, basically. No, but I've been following your stuff on social media, and mm. obviously I, I speak to you quite often yeah. as well. You know, you, you you've been doing some great great stuff. Uh, yeah. And it's been well received, and all of this just started. You wasn't doing this before, were you? From it no. just it just well, did off with the COVID nineteen stuff. Yeah, it's a COVID nineteen. But uh, to give you that uh, base a bit, a bit of initiative, uh, to be honest, we started from Masjid Umar, right? And obviously from that, and that's in your ward, in your constituency, and from Stony Gate to Evington. So you know, a big respect that you know from a Masjid. Uh, from that place, we've actually delivered miles and miles and miles. So it's you know it's thanks to all you guys, really. I mean, everyone's doing a brilliant job. Yeah, the, the the mosque when they were setting this up, and I, sp yeah. I spoke to to one of the Molanas and the team there. They've done a fantastic job in and around Absolutely. preparing these food parcels and getting the donations in and and playing their part. They've done a really really 
you know a good task and they've and they've demonstrated on behalf of the muslim community like a lot of groups have out there Absolutely. that you know they're, they're about charity they're about sharing they're about being part of the community it's not this you know isolated perception this misperception that the the media have of our, our communities right. i think a, a lot of the broader neighborhoods around Leicester, Leicestershire and Rutland have well have, have really stood up and said, you know what, fair play to a lot of the work that's been going on. So, you know, credit. Well done well done to to you. Yeah, thank you. And I'd just like to mention, Kirk, um, is bit of, we built uh, a lot of good bridges with different communities and even the frontline staff, you know, with the police and everyone. So I mean it's wonderful the way it's happened. And sometimes I don't know, it, it could be a blessing in disguise because the communities had to get together and uh, everyone had to work together. So I personally think it's a blessing in disguise. Yeah, that, that's what that's a point that you mentioned earlier as well, um, mm. Corey, going forward, the networking and, and stuff. Is that something we should be building on, Corey, through the next phases of this? I think it's something we have to build on to to maintain. I think, you know, we're quite lucky that we've got the relationships and the partnerships that we've already got in place. But you can't let them go stagnant. You've got to continue that work and you've got to continue building on what you've already got. So, yeah, I definitely think we should continue and carry that through with us. And what do you what do you think, Arif, um, Jedzi will be? the best way to bring all of these groups together to share the learning, to share their experiences. And I think more importantly, what I'd like to see is how we can build that network to continue to support each other where necessary. Definitely. So I think the Leicester Community Response Group that's been set up, it could be utilised a lot better. If you've already got organisations that are willing to work together on there and everyone brings their own learning expertise in, there's someone coordinating it all. That's the main thing. You need someone who's going to be able to coordinate it and manage it effectively. <laughs> and then that way you'll have all the uh, all the groups and you know charities and organisations that want to help if there's ever anything like this, if there's any kind of flooding, if there's an emergency where there's a fire, for example, and you know suddenly someone needs you know X, Y, and Z. Between us all, we could have all these resources and we can get them out ASAP. And the thing is, I think sense of urgency is a key thing because when someone needs help, they need help there and then. They don't need help in two weeks after the form's been vetted or someone's got through their paperwork and stuff and then make a decision. So if you've got people that have got all, you know, they can pull their resources together and work with urgency, it'll be, it'll, it'll be beneficial to the whole community. So if we just build out the platform that's already been created around the Leicester Community Response Hub, because the way that's been designed is all projects and organizations kind of affiliate to it and when there's a call out in from that central point whoever can then be part of whatever the call out is then so be it whether it's volunteering whether it's donating whether it's fundraising or mm. whatever it is that that that's kind of what you're saying isn't it mm. basically yeah, yeah. I and mean, like i said uh, you know what people working together Together, everyone can make a difference. You know, it's a cliche thing, but it's actually true. One person on their own can only do so much, but when you've got teams of people working towards the same goal, it makes it a lot easier. And that's the key thing here. I think we need to kind of make sure we then take advantage of this, everyone networking and working together and make it so that it's easier for maybe people to just handle certain areas or certain kind of people or certain, you know, people with certain needs are looked after by, you know, the people with the relevant skills, that kind of stuff. Uh, obviously, like for example, like us, homelessness is our forty. So, if anything like that, you send them towards us or another one of the groups that do deal with homelessness, mental health, for example. You know, single mothers who have just had new babies and you know might be struggling, that kind of thing. Someone who specialises in that. So, I think it's key for someone to either be appointed or to want someone to take lead on running that group and making sure that the uh, resources are utilised properly. Mm. I think, and you may be able to help with with this as a, as an answer as well. I have a, I have my own opinion, but as a community, we're very well, you know, we're part of the fabric of this city now. We've been here for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years, maybe 80 years. People would argue um, we have brilliant infrastructure through all the religious establishments that we have through business. We're very well um connected in the business world we have a number of businesses from textiles through to leisure through to food outlets and so on and so on why can't we coordinate our communities 
No one wants to answer that. Hassan and Hussein, I'm going to put you on the spot. Tell uh, me, tell me the answer. You know, you've just you've just nailed it on the head, Keg. Regard to the fabric of this community, and you know how come we can't all really come together when we should be really coming together? You know, the work never stops, Keg. It's just basically what Ari said. I, I completely agree with what Ari's saying that. Why can't we all work together and signpost each other rather than, you know, everyone having their own little thing? But my question to that would be very simple. If we can create such a community where we all can help each other all the time, the work shouldn't stop. If the work stops, then we stop. So we're going to carry on doing what we're doing. And I expect that a lot of other people, same organizations, will carry on doing what they're doing. Because through this goodness, whether it's coronavirus or not coronavirus, we all got to stick together and make this plan that we can carry on. And that's the main thing. Mm. And I think one thing that's definitely been highlighted through this um, situation, there are a lot of families, there are a lot of people that do need help in whichever way whichever form it is and it's not just COVID-19 because they need help they are there and they do need help Absolutely. what do you think Corey? yeah I think you know a lot of the people that have come through to us it, they're not always in need in direct relation to COVID-19 it could be that you know actually the the usual provision they've always needed help but their usual provisions have had to to rein in what support that they can offer or you know uh, uh, so thinly spread now because the need is much wider in direct relation so it's, it's it is really a difficult one if i'm honest it is it's a difficult one i've been asked a question um somebody's somebody's texting a question i've got a question as well on, on my phone that i've been asked let me just answer this one that's coming through the chat it's not really related i think it's more a, a personal question about their situation it's relating to schools and schools opening so the national announcement was that schools will reopen on the 1st of june um but schools as far as i i understand the local authority will be putting a message out um to parents and via to schools what i would say in regards to people that are awaiting an announcement don't do anything in regards to sending kids to school until your school has contacted you to say that they're open and who is eligible or which year groups are able to go back to school. Your school should be contacting you to inform you when that's going to happen. And it may happen at different times. It might not all be on the 1st of June. So contact your schools to find out what's going on. Get the information from the school in terms of which year groups are going back and who's eligible to return and then those messages follow those messages rather than just a random everybody turn up on the 1st of June because that's not how it's going to happen sorry about that the other message um, in regards to this what do you think we should be doing going forward after COVID-19 well after COVID-19 could be anyway it could be next year next Christmas or whatever will you guys still be doing work in the community after COVID-19? Now, you've both got projects, so the answer to that is yes. What will you be doing that's different, if anything? Oh, gosh. So, like I say, I think for us, we're going to have to put a lot of our focus into homelessness prevention. And I think, you know, we'd also have to need to see what what additional dimensions the local authority are putting in place. You know, we, we, this is a learning curve for everyone. And I think... Like I said earlier, we're very good as an organisation at, at fitting where we need to fit and adapting to, to whatever hole that may be. So we'll continue to do that. We'll continue to liaise with our with our working partnerships and with other organisations to identify what the need is and, and we'll develop to, to fit. Have we lost Hassan and Hussein again? Yeah, I think I think I think we've we've lost them. Their reception's probably dropped out again. So not not to worry. We'll we'll pick those back up. Your organisation helped the homeless, Jedzy. I've been seeing a lot of the stuff that you do. You do the the market on the Wednesdays. You have a whole range of activities that go on. Somebody's asked a question relating to. I I, I did ask it earlier, but you kind of said it a little bit. But somebody's asked a question here. The percentage of people that you deal with, how many are Muslim? That's a very direct question, I know, but... No, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Percentage-wise, Corey, what's the stats? Because you better with stats. 
Last time I looked, somewhere around 20%. So because one in five think... of all the clients you see are from the Muslim yeah. community. Yeah, and oh, I wow. know that. I wasn't expecting what... you to say that. One of the questions oh. we ask is dietary requirements. So that is on the assumption that everyone that's asking for halal is from a Muslim family or have a Muslim family. So that's based I, I on that question. Yep. Well, are, you, are you basing this on the uh, food packaging and stuff and the food parcels? From the CCC? So our no, 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 no. Are we I talking think, in, general? Person, no, yeah, in general? Yeah, in general, in general. Still say it's about one in five. If you look at, I'm looking at my filing cabinet now. If you look at our our housed people, I'd still say one in five, about twenty percent. Let's just say, look, one nation give us uh, five thousand pounds in zakat money. I think it was in December, yeah. and I think by end of Jan it was gone. It's gone, literally. Even now, because because of uh, Ramadan and whatnot, people have give, be, been giving me zakat money. We've mm. we've used quite a lot of that, big chunks of that, on people that. Uh, Eligible for zakat. Mm-hmm. Wow! So one one in five. I was really not expecting you to 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 say that as a figure. So you know, all communities have problems. I'm not going to pretend we don't as a as a community. What can we do to 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 change that curve? I know curve's probably the wrong word because that's a COVID <laughs> word now, isn't it? But you know, I don't want to break the trends and the modelling and so on. But how, how do we how do we turn that curve around, Arif? What? Sorry, Corey, go on. Why, why does that statistic, one in five, I'm saying this as someone with a non-Muslim background, why does one in five shock you? Because, well, it doesn't, it doesn't shock me, to be honest. Um, I, I, I'm not surprised by that because I see it. I, I, you know, it's part of my work, it's part of my role, I see it. But from a community perspective, I think a lot of members in our community would be shocked that charities that are doing homelessness, you know, trying to house people, feeding people providing food parcels that one in five of your clients are from our community we kind of pride ourselves on being a very generous community a very outward going community one that kind of looks after its own within its own networks and these people are slipping through the net um and and that's that's worrying that's worrying for me as part of this community rather than just being a statistic and a number and i'd like to know you know why why is that happening so so okay. Corey, you know out of the muslim muslim clientele that we've got service users mm-hmm. homeless people mm-hmm. yeah how many of them would you say were due to addictions be it alcohol drugs or gambling probably a, a further 20 percent of the 20 percent so probably again I think, one I think in more than 20 i think more than 20 percent. no i think the majority of the of the muslim service users that we have are people that have come from overseas from other muslim, muslim countries and are waiting for their right to remain status or asylum seekers or refugees actually mm, true yeah i think but then then you, got, you can break it down further by saying potentially people born here some Muslims that were born here, like myself, kind of thing, or the ones that have come over. Then out of those, I think the high percentage it's a higher percentage then. Isn't yeah. It? Yeah. So it's either drugs, alcohol, or gambling. That's probably the cause for them being gambling is there. probably high in substance use, actually. Yeah, and I and I and I see some of that as well, which is very disappointing on a number of fronts but you know this is this is the world we live this is you know it's 2020 and if we're not providing services for our communities and our families and our and our young people then they'll go and look for services elsewhere and sometimes those services are detrimental to their well-being so gambling and the 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 social lives that you know the nightclubbing and so on and so on you know they will look for outs young people look for outs and if we're not providing them they will look for them elsewhere. I've got another stat that's coming, which again is a is, is a massive surprise. So you know, one roof, and you'll probably know this stat as well. Ninety percent of all the females housed by one roof charity are from a Muslim background. Mm. Yeah, ninety percent. That's high, man. Well, now, one one, one roof for a cost? homeless charity. They 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 provide accommodation for people that haven't got anywhere to stay. Again, they one, that, roof, to, one of the specialisms that one roof have is is that they do help people that don't have recourse to public funds. So again, helping people that have come from overseas countries that 
that haven't got access to the statutory services yet. So again, I, I would I would be interested to see what percentage of that ninety percent were born in Leicester. Yeah, that's true. And, and do you think that's a good? And how many? Sorry, and then how many of those are maybe people that are suffering from domestic violence, fleeing domestic violence, that kind of stuff as well? Yeah. Because they do pick, a, pick those kind of people up really quickly. That's a huge one, and that's probably something for a completely different different show and does need to be touched on because it's a, another one of those taboo areas in our community that doesn't exist. I don't know why mm. I put my hands up to do like inverted commas and I'm on the radio, but yeah, it, it, it doesn't exist, but it absolutely does exist. Um, and it's, okay. it's, it's it's gone. Do do you think then from you know, and I'm saying this again as as an outsider from from the Muslim community as such. Do you think then the Muslim community are, are less likely to support um, Muslims with substance use uh, substance use issues or you know other other complex needs or is it is it an understanding issue? Is it is it what is it? I think there's a there's a there's one organisation that springs to mind that support and help um, young people and adults with substance misuse issues. And when I say that one one organisation uh, and a, a Muslim organisation from within the community, there's probably two actually that spring to mind. But outside of that, they're all third sector. They're all statutory partners organizations that don't necessarily connect very well with the communities and not just the muslim communities just main communities and those that are hard to reach and vulnerable to be honest mm. um so there's a ra- range of different reasons for that and i think it's that acceptance that you know we do have these issues in our community of course we do who are we trying to kid you know by pretending they're not there it's even it's, it's ridiculous to, to pretend it's not there they're there but i i would like us to have more services available in-house if you want to use that phrase um that 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 we shouldn't be needing statutory services we should be able to deal with these issues in-house in the first instance for a range of different reasons and then if the in-house services are not adequate or they're not skilled enough and you need to a bit more expertise or to signpost then we do that but for me at this moment in time there's very few services predominantly in our communities that are available to 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 those domestic violence homelessness etc cetera, etc cetera. we're relying on the goodwill of charities elsewhere in the sectors like yours yours has not been set up for muslim communities it's for anybody it's for any, anybody can access it and and so it should be but there's just there's just ways that we could do we're a very influential community in this city in so many ways but we're not very good i don't think at protecting our most vulnerable people in society i just don't see that on the front line i don't know jedzy what do you think do you do you think as muslims that we concentrate too much maybe on foreign aid or i mean i know it's needed i'm not saying it's not needed definitely but do you think we kind of neglect local issues based on that well somebody somebody kind of categorized that really well for me once when they're saying you can pe- you can send money abroad 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 but one day because we'd have neglected our own community there'll be nobody to give you money to send abroad because they won't understand the concept of it anymore and the good that comes with it and the blessings and so on and so on so mm-hmm. yeah of course you have to look after your own in the first instance and there's also the, you know that brilliantness of giving but things start in your own house and in your own mm-hmm. communities, and that's our first responsibility. Charity begins at home. Charity begins at home. That was the, probably the right phrase I was looking for. We've got 40 seconds, 20 seconds for you to wrap up, guys. Give me give me your best shot. Go on, Corey, you can do it. Oh, I think it's like I commented the other day, isn't it? That, you know, it's not about religion, race, creed or other. It's about being a humanitarian and doing what we can for everybody, regardless. Absolutely. I, I'd echo that. Do good, enjoy your time through through rums and do the right things. You know, help everyone. Help everyone. Great line to end on. I'll see you all next week. Kirkmaster signing out. Ramadan FM. Thank you guys.